Today in Across the Fence, the basics of wildlife tracking. We're going to scour the woods using all of our senses to find clues that animals have left behind. Good afternoon and thanks for joining us. I'm Judy Simpson. When most people think of wildlife tracking, they picture finding fresh tracks and following them to see or catch the animal. But fresh tracks are only part of the story. Expert trackers use all kinds of evidence, including droppings, hair, and tooth marks. Across the Fences, Rebecca Gollin found a Vermont expert who teaches wildlife tracking around the state to all ages using his senses. When the animal was done, it then hopped over this and took off right up that way, angled up. Mm -hmm. And right here is where it landed. And that white head of this pin is basically right in the middle of a nice fox track. Mike Kessler sees things more clearly than most people. That's a nice one, but all four feet would have landed. Here's another one in here. But if you want, you can kind of just lightly put your finger in there. And if you look close, you can see where it even broke the leaves and there's a nail mark there, right there and right there. Kessler teaches wildlife tracking for the University of Vermont and in communities around the state. It's a tricky subject to teach. It's something that cannot be learned from a textbook. What they drink? Yeah. I just try to share my enthusiasm and joy for tracking with others. And it, it goes well beyond that because it's a skill that isn't, hasn't been passed down really in books or movies or any other form. It's been passed down through generations of trackers around the world. Then lots of times we go out in the woods and we go out looking for a four-legged animal but we go about thinking about it like the way it would be if it were us, a two-legged animal. The way if we would walk On this woods. day, Kessler joined Eric Barker's third grade class woods, from Jericho Elementary animal. School for a and field trip. We're in a classroom, animal. we're working with biomes and habitats and uh, learning about life cycles with animals. And Mike gave us an opportunity to do some tracking right out in Mills Riverside Park. And it's not a link. Kessler and fellow tracker Bill Marple this. first Anybody introduced the class to some tracking basics. After that, it was time for some hands-on learning. Who would like to be a prey? We just set the tables up and had this little predator-prey game going. And just wanted to get him to just do that motion without even telling him why. So then when we walked out into the woods, into another area, and said, okay, here's your pavilion. You were a prey, how would you play that game here? And by thinking about how they were moving amongst all those picnic tables and where they would hide, et cetera. So now I said, you know, those bushes, those are picnic tables. How would you play the game? Go to where you are if you're a predator. If you're a prey, go hide. And so that's what they did. And sure enough, you know, right away, you saw they were on the fox trails. Thank you. Heading into the woods led to the discovery not only of fox trails, but also of deer tracks, of a print from a running bear, and even a mystery track that clearly needed further study. We found a track that's very interesting called the jumping moose track. What did it look like? Um, it kind of looked like a small moose that can jump. Although the jumping moose probably doesn't really exist, that kind okay. of thinking Jack is exactly what Kessler right. likes to see. Is Imagination is it's not a dirty word in tracking. Mike. Kessler says that for his younger students, it's that imagination that can make them more open to finding something interesting in the woods. You have to like close your eyes and pretend that there's eyes, like eyes on your fingers and pretend that you're closing your eyes and look in between and seeing if it's a paw or not. You always try to meet people where they are, give them a point of connection, which they already have, so that they're only half a step away from connecting with something that they may not even know is out there, may not believe is possible. Barker hopes that the connection his students take away from this lesson will include not only the animals whose tracks they're searching for, but also the land itself. We're always trying to connect the work we're doing in here to what we can do out in our own community. So Mills Riverside Park is a great resource for us. We go outside and learn about habitats, but also the geology connections to the park and connecting students to their home place and community. Those connections are taking root. So we've, so we know you have to here, like, like feel here here. the ground, move the leaves, and like look at the so stuff that they eat, like leaves, berries, and something and grass. Because sometimes, if they are like a deer, they eat 
eat off little bites of little branch, branches and then you feel them like like the stick where they ate it off. Well, if there's like a deer or a squirrel or something, there's probably a predator around trying to get it. And so we in herbivores like deer stand in packs, like stay together. And then we just, when we, so when you find like one track, you're, you're most likely to find another. I found a fox track from about seven feet away. It was very challenging to do, but you just have to focus and you can find one. Applying that focus to the world around you is key to Kessler's lesson. You just have to slow down, really just slow down, let all of the chatter inside slow down. We stop when we stop thinking and we stop focusing, we stop tunneling, we stop labeling, we stop projecting all of the thoughts and our biases, our prejudices onto the world on whether or not we can even find a track today in the rain or whether or not we can find a track from five years ago today in the rain. And then when we start from there, that's where we begin. When we let go of all of that, we can start with a clean slate. Letting go of what we know in order to see more clearly. It's advice from a man who can see the forest, the trees, and everything in between. We weren't born a thousand years too late to do this. We've got the same tools within us that every other tracker had. In Jericho, I'm Rebecca Gollin with Across the Fence. Well, thanks, Rebecca. Joining me now is tracking instructor Mike Kessler. Thanks so much for being with us. You're welcome, Jeannie. Looks like a lot of fun out in the woods. Yes, it is. <laughs> that was a great time. Now, you said tracking is not necessarily something that you learn from a book. So where did your training come from? Well, my training came from a gentleman named Tom Brown, Jr. And uh, he has written a book called The Science and Art of Tracking, mm -hmm. which is um, an attempt to put some of it in printed form. But in essence, it's, um, it's a lineage, it's a tradition of tracking that's, that's handed down verbally. And um, when I took one of his courses, I, I really got hooked, especially on the fact that um, when he said that, don't believe anything I say, just prove me right or prove me wrong. And so I went about doing that, and uh, it's been a wonderful, wonderful, remarkable journey of, of seeing what can be done with tracking and this primitive technology that um, cultures around the world used literally for their survival. Mm -hmm. And so we saw you working with some school kids, but you work with people of all ages. Yes, yeah, all ages, and um, that's, that's the fun and the joy of it, because it's really connecting everybody. I think we never lose that, that everybody likes to connect with the outdoors, and um, tracking really helps us do that. And so what's been the most challenging in terms of teaching tracking? Uh, um, the most challenging, and this is probably, it's probably also the most rewarding, is that sometimes uh, when people approach tracking, um, they have to be open, really open to a new way of doing things. And when our hands are closed too tight, we can't be open to something new. Mm -hmm. But then on the other hand, there can be folks who are open to everything and anything. And when we're like that, it's hard. Everything goes through our fingers. So it's a balancing act to be both open, but yet we have to scientifically, we have to close and grasp what we're to find out what we have. So in other words, there's a science and there's an art. Mm -hmm. And so when we hit that harmonic or that balance between the two, um, it's really wonderful. It's basically the, the, the essence of um, any good investigative technique, which is to really be open, but to prove yourself right, prove it wrong. Now you also mentioned too that you could find a track that could be years old. Yes. <laughs> I can't believe that. That's, I mean, no. I, you, know, you stop to think about that and you say, well, that can't be because five years, one track, how could that be? But then you think, well, why not, I guess, if no one else has stepped there? Right, that's what I meant about also our, um, our assumptions, our projections, our what I call their biases, filters, etc. Um, we assume the way things are, but until we actually investigate, we realize that, oh, things may be a little different. For instance, each year when the leaves fall, um, they all fall at the same time and they all age at the same time. 
and they even form little layers like separate tarps. Mm -hmm. They're different color and texture for each year. And come springtime, the ones, they're almost stuck together like paper mache. You can right. pick up several at a time. So by doing that, when you lift that up and you see a track underneath there, you know it was before those leaves fell. Well, you can do that each year until it becomes compost or mm -hmm. peat. So that's one way of going back in time. There are more, but just that alone, because there's, there's nobody's job in the woods to go and erase the tracks other than Mother Nature with aging. Yeah, is there yeah. A, a best time of year? To, I, would, I would think winter would be a great time just because fresh snow, fresh tracks. Right. Winter is a, winter is a good time. Mm -hmm. But right now I think the best time is right where we're heading into um, winter where we'll have some light snow, which will give a good outline of animals' prints. But also there will be places, patches where there are no snow. Mm -hmm. And that's an opportunity to see a trail that's in snow so you know it's there and it's believable, but then it may leave the snow and go into some pine needles where there is no snow, and that's where we go, where to go, and we can't find it. And that's where I wanted to okay. use this poster here to show that these are really the gifts in nature from the animals because they, they typically are what don't exist or we're not going to find. Right. Like for this fox track right here, there may be one in a thousand. Um, that would look be that like perfect. That. Right, except when there's snow. Mm -hmm. However, if we have a little bit of snow and you're following a fox and it goes into pine needles, what you want to do is look in the pine needles and look at the disturbance, the disturbance that it made because you know it walked through there. And so that's where, um, that's where we really we redefine a track as a disturbance to a baseline mm -hmm. because what's happening is an animal's moving, there's force implied to the ground, it's imparted through the shape of its foot mm -hmm. and it propagates through the earth. And so that propagation of force is the disturbance. And so we re actually redefine a track to be a disturbance to a baseline. And I have a little demonstration I usually show okay. people, which is, <laughs> this is, this will be our baseline. Okay, so instead of mud or leaves, we have tinfoil. But just to show the propagation of force, if I make a thumbprint and put my thumb there and turn it, okay, you can see that where my thumb was, is it's right here. It's right there. But look at everything else that moved around it. Right. So, so that, in essence, the track on this tinfoil is actually going even off the tinfoil. It's 20 times bigger than my thumb. So, granted, this, the earth is not tinfoil, but the earth does move. Leaves move, snow moves, things move around the track. And so quite often we end up looking for the negative or the hole mm -hmm. that isn't there. But what is there is what's happening around the track. Mm -hmm. So I brought some pictures. Okay. And so Let's maybe take a look at those. Take a, yes. Uh, the first one is, okay, this is where, um, when I mentioned <laughs> meeting, meeting people where they're at with kids or yeah. actually with anybody, even the college students who've grown up, we know what the game Where's Waldo. Right. And so that's, in essence, a game of finding a disturbance to a baseline, which is finding Waldo within the crowd. Mm -hmm. So um, next we have, this is a picture of an owl. <laughs> in a tree, okay. in between those two branches. Right. And so this concept of a disturbance to a baseline, what's neat about, what is neat about tracking, is that not only is it a concept for finding and following tracks, but it's also um, predator, prey, mm -hmm. survival. Most things, our animals are moving to um, within a baseline and trying not to be a disturbance to it so that they can either hide if they're a predator or a prey. Um, in the next picture, this one might be harder to see for the folks at home, but there's about a dozen lizards, and they're hard to see, except they have a distinctive feature, which is a stripe down their back. And so once we tune into the stripe, mm -hmm. we start to see, we can almost count them. Right, okay. no, we're not to step. <laughs> right, so I, I have to, I don't know where they, where they actually are, live, but I have to imagine they probably live among some grasses maybe that look like that stripe, and so mm -hmm. maybe it helps them. But other than that, that's actually a giveaway. Um, and so that would stripe would be a disturbance to their baseline. Right. Um, here is a picture of a, um, an iceberg. And this I just like to have, you know, a picture's worth a thousand words. And in essence, with the track, if you think of what's above the surface of the water as the foot, mm -hmm. the actual propagation of force, as I showed with this tinfoil, and what you, you noticed right away, is much larger in proportion. Right. So when we think about an iceberg and we think about it being really that big, when we think about a track, the disturbance really is that big. It doesn't necessarily go down, but it goes out. 
So you're looking for more than just one little track. You're looking for a whole series of clues. A, right. A pattern of disturbance, yes. Well, if you'd like to learn more about Mike's introduction to wildlife tracking courses, you can contact UVM Continuing Education. The website is learn.uvm.edu, or you can call the Continuing Education Office toll-free at 1-800-639-3210. I gotta head out in the woods, <laughs> see what I'm missing. <laughs> Thanks a lot for joining us today. You're welcome, Judy, it's been fun, thank you. That's our program for today, I'm Judy Simpson. We'll see you again next time on Across the Fence. For a video copy of today's program, call toll free 1-888-ATF-3430. Across the Fence is brought to you as a public service by University of Vermont Extension and WCAX-TV.